phase drug design. Now, in terms of what's going to be tested, because I'm going to go through a little bit of background on the project here. And what we're doing is we're talking about the application of structure based drug design. That's the best way to do it rather than just spitting out definitions of what is it and what molecules, how do we optimize molecules? How do we go from hit to lead stuff like that? How do we look at x-ray structure? It's better to show you an application and especially one that I've done where, so I can explain it better. Um, but you can look at this tons of papers on any drug discovery project has this kind of workflow where it goes from a, a, a lead or a, a hit to our lead based on um, optimizing the structure to optimize and uh, design the structure based on the uh, based on the binding of the molecule to the protein. So in terms of what you guys need to know for this is what we're mainly going to focus on is how do we optimize a structure? What goes into it? And we, we talk about the x-ray structure. We talk about the compound structure. We talk about how to do use process of elimination to kind of figure out what is the best and most potent or what are the best and most potent functional groups to put on a structure. A lot of it is common sense, but I, it's important to explain to you because if I just show a bunch of compounds, you won't know what's going on. Um, and that's really it. So I wouldn't say focus on the theory of what I did. So I wouldn't say focus, I, I've said my specialty is the MAP kinase pathway, but not to focus on the specifics of the MAP kinase pathway, that won't be tested on. Neither will the intricacies of the thermal shift assay that I just explained. That's on here too. Um, I also developed an enzyme assay that I'll talk about briefly, but it's not going to be tested on because I'm gonna talk about it very briefly. Um, so mostly the structure and how it relates to the function. That's really the concept behind that. And I'm not gonna be testing you on my specific project either because that'd be really conceited of me. So what you'll be tested on is the theory itself on how to go about it. So general questions about structure-based drug design. Let's jump into it. So just to be brief, cancer, I'm trying to make a drug that changes proteins involved in cancer. We've talked about that a lot. So, and again, this we're talking about the MAP kinase pathway. So there are, I've shown you this exact plot before, or this exact uh, uh, diagram showing different or the two main proliferative pathways involved in cancer, that being MAP kinase and PI3K. And they're both, they can both have some crosstalk and it's very complicated, but basically when these proteins are active, when, when, the, when the KRAS is active, when ERK is active, when RAF is active, when SOS is active, you have an increased amount of cancer. So increased amount of cell growth. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to find, well, uh, ideally find an inhibitor for one of these interactions that leads to a constitutive active response, meaning always active or always on for the proteins and that which leads to cancer. So um, here's basically just to, just to put it into context, instead of this entire diagram, we're only focusing on that interaction right there. So the interaction between that happens and it's mutated KRAS, meaning that KRAS can't be turned off anymore, then we have cancer. So those are the that's the uh, exact target, those cancerous KRAS proteins. And of course, that leads into, uh, into the based on transcription factor activation and then uh, eventually transcription and gene, uh, gene activation. All right, so we kind of talked about that already. Um, so the novel concept that I brought to the table, which I'm going to mention now, because ideally, like I said, we want to find inhibitors. So compounds that bind to our protein of interest and knock down the function. But in some cases, an activator or something that could uh, enhance the function of a protein might be important for actually knocking down the entire cell's proliferation. This concept is called cellular senescence. And it can be, it can be uh, induced several ways. So if you treat a, drug, treat a, a cell with some kind of uh, toxic agent, 
the cell will most likely go through either apoptosis or it will just cellularly senesce, meaning it will it won't grow anymore. It'll just be dormant. That's good. We want cancer cells to be dormant and not grow anymore. So yeah, that's why they have radiation therapy. That's why they have strong chemotherapy drugs that really destroy the cell. And but that what that does as a side effect is it destroys healthy cells. And that's where we get a lot of our side effects for uh, radiation therapy and a lot of our chemotherapy drugs is they also affect healthy cells. They're not as specific as we'd like them to be. But if we were to activate the pathway what we, uh, to an extent where it's so far beyond its natural level of activation, we could actually cause the, cause the cell, the cancer cell, to be like, whoa, we're proliferating too fast and like kind of like, and, and not function anymore. So it's kind of like if you're running downhill and you're sprinting downhill and you get tripped up and you fall down because you're going too fast for your body to handle, that's the same kind of thing, but in a cellular context. So there has been theoretical evidence of it before my, or actually this came out during my thesis, so I wasn't too happy about it, but it's really good evidence that there is a, um, the, the, uh, the type of that, that is activated. When it's phosphorylated, it's activated. So as you increase the concentration, the bipolar concentration of the drug, but first you're increasing the activity of the micromolar. You're actually decreasing the activity of the pathway. This is very interesting. And this showed that at high concentrations, you're achieving the cellular senescence and the cells aren't growing anymore. Or we don't know that. We know that the MAP kinase pathway was no longer activated after hyperactivating it, which theoretically would suggest that the entire cell, if the cell line is a uh, MAP kinase based cancer cell line, if you knock down the MAP kinase pathway, the cell will stop growing. So that could, that's, that's most likely true, but until you do a cellular viability assay, you don't know for sure. Um, so that's the concept. So we're trying to find out. So what I try to do here is I try to justify not only finding an inhibitor, but by finding an activator, it can also be valuable to drug discovery. And I didn't think of that in the beginning. What I did was I screened a bunch of compounds. I found a few inhibitors that weren't any good. I found some activators that were pretty good. So I was like, you know what, let's tailor my story a little bit. Let's try to see, let's investigate more on activators and see how that could be important to, to pharmaceuticals. And that's why I, I that's why you, you kind of write the beginning of the project. Whenever you're doing a thesis, you find the data, you find out what you find, because you can't control the biology. And then you tailor the story to give that, give those findings life, which is, which is the way you do it. You kind of write it from the, the backwards forward or the end to the beginning kind of thing. Is there any questions on that concept? And the, the dark line here is the before. That basically means that's a positive control. If you treat it with EGF, of course you're gonna have a ton of phospho R because the, the map kinase pathway will be directly activated. Then we kind of said the same thing. And so what he did was he did the cell viability test. Viability, that means um, the cells are dying. And also, um, so over time they're dying, which means they're either going through apoptosis or they're going through senescence. But they found out it wasn't apoptosis because there wasn't any, there wasn't much caspase expression. Um, but but in cellular senescence, they actually didn't do it. They didn't do the uh, beta galactosidase assay that I always wanted to do. But then I graduated, and I'm like, well, I'm not going to just get a job. <laughs> but uh, that's something that you could do. So oh, now, if, are there any questions on kind of what I was trying to figure out? So we have a protein, trying to figure out something that sticks to it to cause some kind of function, whether it activates or inhibits. That's basically it. Okay, let's talk about structure now. So the structure-based drug design of how do we go about this? How do, what do we do? So yeah, many companies and many schools have uh, libraries of thousands and maybe millions of compounds. So I found out my company has 700 million compounds. They're not all there. Otherwise, it wouldn't be able to fit. But 
we have access to 700 million compounds that are in our in our proprietary library. And yes, they're probably cross-referenced with a lot of other libraries, but that's how many compounds there are. So a lot of these companies, Merck maybe has more than a billion. So like these is a lot of compounds. So when you're screening them, you don't screen all of them. That will take years. So what you do is you start off with one of these, an X-ray structure. So these X-ray structures are usually created by academia or maybe in, in pharma. If you have an X-ray crystallographer that is that can figure out the correct conditions for crystallizing a protein. Crystallizing the protein with the compound, sure, that would be great. Even without the compound, if it's a new target, that's good. So in my job right now, we have a protein that we only have the crystallography of one isoform. We're dealing, we want to drug another isoform. We know that isoform is kind of similar, but not exactly the same. So who's to say that the little pockets exhibit on the one we're trying to drug are the same as the one on the X-ray structure? We don't know. That's why we're a startup company and we're screening all these compounds in order to figure something out and we're exploring new territory. So whenever you explore new territory, like I did here and like I'm doing now, there's gonna be a lot of questions because if there wasn't, then people would have done it already. So this is very important to start out from this exploratory area and it's a lot of fun for me. So anyway, you start off with an X-ray structure. Now in this X-ray structure, it was a co-crystallization of HRAS, which is an, a more stable isoform of RAS. A lot of the X-ray structures are HRAS rather than KRAS. Very similar, like I said, the different isoforms, one of them might crystallize e more easily than the other one. That also means we have SOS, which is this in the binding of action of turning the RAS protein on. Is when SOS binds to it, it facilitates the nucleotide, which is uh, guanine diphosphate, to come out, and then guanine triphosphate to go in. This is actually guanine triphosphate, because you see, there's one phosphorus, in red is phosphorus, so there's one, two, three phosphorus. Those are oxygen. So, if I do one, it's, oh, GDP, yeah, it's GDP. Okay, cool. The other one's tucked behind the purple. So, um, anyway, oh yeah, now I see. Phosphorus part of the other oxygen. The other oxygen is over here. Anyway. So you have a guanine diphosphate. So this X-ray structure is the first start of structure-based drug design. So you take a bunch of computational chemists, structural biologists, even biochemists, really everybody from the team, and you look at it. You run some simulations of compounds in your library using, uh, we use a, well, I used to use Schrodinger suite. There is also other, other softwares that I'm not really familiar with that are a lot bigger and can run it on like a supercomputer and, they could actually take millions of iterations of each compound into different pockets. And it could theoretically test the binding energy associated with each, with each interaction. And then it can create a list. And this list could be highest, uh, highest percent chance of binding to lowest. And you take the first, you take the first 20,000 on that list, and then you actually run them in an assay. That is how we determine what to test and what to screen. Not random. That's one way to do it. So we're taking the structure. We are running a, uh, a computational simulation to see how many compounds of our 700 million can possibly bind to it, possibly bind to it. We might come up with 20,000. We'll test those 20,000 and we'll find out that only 100 of them actually bind. And then we test those further and we find maybe three are the same class and bind pretty well. Then we can optimize those three. To make one. That's usually how it goes. The second way to go to figure out how much or how many compounds you're and also which compounds you're screening is based on prior knowledge. So let's say you don't have a extra structure, but you have work that um, UCLA did in the 80s that suggests that if you have a an amine, a uh, a pyrazole ring with an amine in a certain core, that core leads to activity in this protein. But there's no extra structure, but you have that evidence and you have that proof. So what that means is your team is gonna be like, all right, the best thing to do would be to take our 
pyrazole amine compounds in our library and test all of them in the assays. That's one way you can do it too. So it's really, you're using everything, you're using the literature, and then you're using the, um, the x-ray structure if you have one. So that's really, that's another, that's something that's done preliminarily to figure out if it's a good target. Is, is it, so the questions we are asking ourselves are, is it a cost-effective target? Meaning how much R&D would have to go into figuring out what compounds are good? If it's a target that no one knows about, let's say it's, a, it's some weird protein that's involved in, um, in elephantitis, right? Something that five people have, nobody like, so let's say it's one of those proteins and there's no extra structure for it. And you really have no literature on that protein. Are you gonna, are you gonna spend all your money and test 700 million compounds? No, because it's a waste of money and what's the chance of you finding anything? You, you have no leads, meaning like no, there's no evidence or prior knowledge. So that's something that we have to consider when we're developing or when we're developing strategies to attack new targets is how we're going to do it, how we're going to do each step. Because this is the hardest step. If we're right, let's say we're using uh, pyrazole amides and we're right and we get, oh crap, we got a ton of them that are binding. We're on the right track. So, and then from there, it's kind of, it's not, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's, it's more straightforward because that pathway has been laid out and it's the same for every project. Okay, any questions on on how you approach this or what this means? Okay, cool. So then, once we do the computational simulations, we can take it a step further. We can look in and we can zoom in on a compound of interest that kind of hits all the criteria on our simulation. Meaning it has, shows potential for hydrogen bonds. It shows a deep hydrophobic pocket for the pore or for any part of the structure to sit in. Because when we're dealing with these, these uh, biochemical divots in the protein, we're not looking for a shallow one. Something like this wouldn't be as good as something like this, the dark one. Because those are deeper pockets that if you have a compound that can kind of orient itself in a way to, to attach in that deep pocket with a nanomolar affinity, it's gonna go there every single time. And it might, since it's deeper, it might have more of a structural relevance to how much the structure is actually changing, which then can lead to a larger thermal shift, which might lead to more of a change in function. Not all the time, but it might. Um, also, something else I want to mention here is location, location, location. So important thing, or an important thing to realize, just wanna make sure my, I just want to make sure I was sharing the correct screen because it's been like 20 minutes in that. Was so um, anyway, uh, location, location, location. How close is the pocket of interest to your active site? That's very important to know. Let's say you have a 150 kilodalton protein, huge protein. The active site is right here. But you have a compound that binds really strong, according to your computational work. On the opposite side, there's, a, there's a, a divot that's really good. It binds with theoretically nanomolar affinity. And let's say your thermal shift or your, your, your SPR, you get nanomolar affinity. But you have to be skeptical about that. You need to think, all right, the, the biochemist or the cellular biologist in you will be like, hmm, that's great binding, biophysicist, but what does that actually do in the functional realm of the protein? And you're like, I don't know, let's try it. And it turns out it might not do anything. It might not change the function of it at all because it's so far away that the little structural changes it's making don't really affect the active site at all. Or, I mean, we don't, have to, we don't only have to worry about active site. There's also other sites in a protein that are important, which is why the fundamental literature for every project is crucial. So like right now in my company, we are um, we're, we're, um, going to attack different targets. I can't say which ones they are, but we are looking to attack two more targets and we're still in mo a month, months long preliminary exploration stages, which is all literature based. We didn't even do anything computationally because that costs money. 
We're just looking at the literature, every piece of x-ray structure we can find. I'm, I'm not doing this. Usually the higher ups are doing this. But the, every piece of x-ray structure, compounds that maybe failed in the past from other groups or really anything we can find. We're talking to other scientists we know about the target. Be like, hey, have you heard anything about this? Or what do you know? What do you, what do you like about it? What don't you like? Stuff like that. And you really go and investigate deep and you have meetings with different disciplines, biochemistry, computational chemistry, organic chemistry, whatever, um, cell, cell, uh, cellular uh, microbiologists, whatever it may be, and uh, to figure out if it's a good target or not. You could have other facets of the protein that are worth exploring, not just the active site of where the substrate binds, but also, let's say, so for a membrane protein. It's not in the membrane, but it's tethered to the intracellular part of the membrane. It's tethered by this thing called a phonosol group. It's a long kind of like lipid tail that kind of anchors into the membrane. One idea that when I was first exploring the KRAS protein, my advisor had was what if you can inhibit that phonosol group from, from binding or from, uh, from doing anything, or maybe you can bind something to it so that the KRAS protein won't bind to the membrane. And that might inhibit it. Because SOS is around the membrane, if KRAS isn't there, it might not be activated. That's a thought. So you can attack the protein from different areas structurally by looking at the structure and let's say, all right, we have a site that's far away from the active site, but it's close to a secondary function of SOS. It's over here, but something else binds like over here. Maybe that could be useful. So there's a lot of questions. I'm kind of looking at this kind of raises more questions than answers. Which is why you do the why you do the work in the first place. So it's it's super interesting. Um, and then in this work, you might find hidden functions of proteins that you didn't know about. So when they first talked about KRAS SOS in like the 80s, they didn't know that SOS bound actually two KRAS molecules. They do. One of them binds here, the other one binds over here. And they're huge interfaces. You can see the amount of contact there is between both proteins is pretty big range of contact. So I don't want to continue to ramble on, but this is these are all the things you have to look at preliminarily when you're looking at structure-based drug design. Is first of all, is the target any good? And where can I attack it? And with what compound class can I can I screen on it? These are very big questions. Any questions? Okay. Cool, cool. All right. So then back to the the uh, we use the word microenvironment, the microenvironment of where the compound is being docked or where is the optimized position for it to uh, be docked in the protein. So this work was actually done by a computational chemist, but I later learned to do it as well with a few compounds. It's pretty tricky. It's fun, but it's, it's pretty tricky. Um, something you have to do is you have to, you have to uh, like, you know, a, a ring structure, like a double ring structure like this, it shouldn't really have any bend. It, it shouldn't really flex at all. So you have to manually go in there. Because the, pro the program's stupid, it doesn't know. But we have to, you have to manually fix all the angles. And that takes like 10 minutes. Like, there's so many angles, like every three angle, one, two, three. I think that should go by four. One, two, three, four. You go like one, two, three, four. One, two, every combination, you have to go through them and fix them at either zero or 180. So it doesn't flex. But anyway. Once you have a docked structure, you can take a look at exactly which amino acid residues they're interacting with. This is what uh, guides your structure. And you usually do this after the first round of screening. If you're lucky enough to develop a, or to uh, find one or two scaffolds, chemical scaffolds, meaning compounds that look the same, if you're lucky enough to find one or two, you would take that scaffold put it into the docking structure and see, all right, where does it bind? Where does it most likely bind? And what are the interactions? So usually, and this is a, this is a, a really good validation, is you're having a lot going on. You're having the x-ray structure. So if you're lucky enough to get your compound crystallized with the protein and you can get this structure, that's the holy grail. But that doesn't like, that's not usually what happens. If you can get that to happen, you're already two steps ahead. But most likely you have an already existing x-ray structure 
And then you take a compound that you either know bound there with that's co-crystallized, and then you change it and then re-dock uh, re it. Or you don't have any compound. You literally draw the compound in here and then dock it. Or you can draw the compound somewhere else and tell the program, find the best place for it in the protein. That takes a long time, but you can do that. And most likely, well, I'm not gonna say most likely it's right. I'd say most likely it's wrong uh, until you have more concrete evidence. So you kind of, a lot of the things in, in uh, figuring out where a compound binds is kind of guesswork to an extent. You're not gonna know. Because if you knew, think about it as a pharmaceutical company. Look, I'm, I'm a young chemist, uh, biochemist. And if I saw, if I knew where the protein, if I knew where the compounds bound, I can suggest things right now that can make it bind to here better and create more interactions. But a lot of these startup companies like mine, and even bigger companies like Merck who are investigating new targets. They don't know where their compound binds until they have a, a crystal structure. And even then they might be wrong because the crystal structure might have it bound five different places. And now in that case, what do you know which is the place that contributes to the function they're seeing? So there's a lot to, there's a lot to consider. That's why it's very difficult to do, which is why billions of dollars a year are being pumped into this. Maybe a trillion, I don't know. But Definitely billions. So yeah, so if you get to this point, no matter how you get there, to figuring, to having a good idea of where the compound binds, let's just ignore the difficulty of that. We'll just go to, we know where the compound binds. How do we optimize it? That's what we're gonna talk about next. Is, so I did my screening, we're not gonna really cover this, but basically I did my enzymatic screening and I figured out how this one, 47. That was, uh, it was good, it was an activator. Then I did more screening, and then I try to find an inhibitor, but it didn't work. And then I did more screening, and I have three compounds now. So there's 47, 159, and 165. There were other ones that were pretty good, too. But why did I pick these three to focus on? Does anybody know? Yeah, what about it? Yeah, they're all the same. That's exactly it. So in... Whenever we're doing a screen, it's a, it's a, uh, it's really good. I'll just say it's really good. I'm a loss. It's too late for words. Um, it's really good to have stru structures of the same motif and from the same uh, core, chemical core, or at least at the same functional group, the same distance away from the core, to at least have the compounds somewhat similar. So this would help guide our structure-based drug design a lot better than if I had three compounds that look completely different. Three compounds that were completely different, one, we might not know if they're specific or not. Two, we might, we, they might all bind, if they are specific, they might all bind to three different places. We don't know. And then we can't use that to guide our design. And also, what can we do with that information? We couldn't even, we'd have to pick one and develop it and pick the other one and develop it differently because it's a completely different structure. But if we have three that are almost identical, that bind very similarly, we can say definitely these bind. And then from the previous work done, I was able to strongly hypothesize that they definitely bind here. But I was in good shape at this point. This is my second year in and I figured out, okay, I have three that bind and they bind there. What do we do to optimize it? That was the next question, but it, I got lucky. So, I mean, I could, if I didn't find this information out, I could, I would still be there. I wouldn't be here right now. So, you got that. Let's just admire this tight curve real quick. Look at that IC50 curve. Go there. Admire that. The left. It was too good. They couldn't handle it. <laughs> uh, Look at that, that's really good too. All right, um, oh yeah, so another thing is, I found an inhibitor, it's weak, but I found one, that's the inhibitor. That structure on the right looks nothing like the other ones, obviously, because the other ones I found were activators, but it also was the only one I found that inhibits at all. And I tested a ton, all of these are, are uh, analogs that, are look, that look similar to that, but they're different in some way. Some functional groups are missing. And I expected at least one of them 
to do anything, but none of them did anything. Which means that even if I were to, to pursue this SAR, it would take years. That means I'd have to either order a ton of compounds that are, that are analogs to figure out anything, or I'd have to make my own, which I don't like synthesis. I don't want to make my own. So, and also this compound was a, the IC50 was 50 microns, so it's pretty weak. So even if I increased its potency by tenfold, which is a long shot, to five micromolar, it's still weak in an enzyme setting. You want to be nanomolar in the enzyme. So it, it, would, it wasn't worth my time to pursue it further. But there's more better, there's better things. So anyway, um, any questions on that? There's more of it, it's a, it's a lot of it has to do with strategy, not just pure, can I find compounds that bind, but strategy of which ones do I pursue? Because if you have a screen of 20,000 compounds that look like they might bind, and you find out that 200 of them bind and they're all of different classes, you have to strategically pick maybe one or two classes to focus on. And you have to pick it right. Otherwise, you might miss, miss a billion dollar drug if you pick the wrong one. So, for example, um, in my job right now, the assay, the, the TR fret assay I developed is now it's picking up steam. It's going well. And I tested a bunch of compounds in it. And I found out of our compounds, out of our small set of like, I think 15 or so that we're really, really focusing on, I got four of them that showed really good results. And three of those four of the same, are of the same class. And we were looking at that. And we figured that out, like in one of our meetings. I'm like, they're the same class. They're amines. Yes. Right, and it's like that's really good. If they're all different classes, you'd, they'd be, you'd be like, ah, you, it's questionable data. But they're all the same class almost, and they they be those of the same class had about the same affinity in the assay. The fourth one was actually stronger, but it was a different class than the other ones. So I like the fourth. One. But we'll see. anyway, so, um, I now that I have now that you have compounds that you like, let's say you have a core, and you have a structure that works, that binds to your target and causes some kind of functional response. In this case, it activated the KRAS enzyme. You can now name it, right? And it turns out this molecule is called caffeine. We all know caffeine. So this is that, this is caffeine. They're all based on caffeine, believe it or not. And I didn't know this going into it. So the, the, the best way to get really good scientific data is to make your scientists blind to the structures. If I just, so I don't, and I also, right now, I have access to everything. I can look at the structures of everything before I run it. I really don't want to, because that might sway my, it might sway, even though I don't want to be biased to scientist, it might even sway the way I, the way I prepare certain things. So if I'm like, hmm, these two, I want them to work really well. So I'm going to like be really, really careful when I'm pipetting and make sure I do a really good job in dilutions. I don't want any bias at all. So I don't look at structures. So in this case, I was completely blind to the structures. And it turns out that three of my best ones look the same. That's a great feeling to know that you're on the right track when finding the data. Uh, so I call it the caffeine core. Um, and there's no literature, there's nothing that's been developed with caffeine as a cancer, a cancer drug ever. So that's pretty cool. And then we saw this already thermal shift. There's another way of, of testing. But really at this point, they know whether they bound to SOS or KRAS. You have two proteins in this mix, right? One of them activates the other one. Obviously, we were searching for a KRAS inhibitor, something that, because that's the protein of interest. But what if it binds to SOS and actually causes it to stick more and, and activate more? I didn't know that. Thermal shift told me that. Told me that I had some evidence, basically, just to be quicker, the TM shifted more than in a dose dependent manner. With SOS, and it didn't really shift in the dose dependent manner with KRAS. This is a loose suggestion because you can see, look at the look at the, uh, look at the, uh, the range, one degree, right? But like I said, thermal shift is pretty sensitive. I kept reproducing this one degree, and I couldn't put error bars in there. But it's part of the interview, I showed this data at my current job. They're like, why aren't there error bars? They try to catch me on like like budging stuff, right? So, but the answer is. In thermal shift, the kind of thermal shift, run to run, there is a slightly different TM for your native protein. 
So let's say here the native protein was 44. If I do it again, the native protein might be 45, might be 43. So the answer is that the compound change, the changes in the TM are relative. Well, no, the changes in the TM, the delta TM change is consistent run to run. But the absolute value of the temperature is relative to the run, or is a run dependent. So I couldn't have error bars in here. But what I could have done, which I which I should have, is have a delta TM and then just mark them all up with the error bars. Because the delta TM would have been about the same. So um, yeah, I mean either way, I, I wouldn't publish this data. This is a very loose suggestion here. Um, saying that it binds to one versus the other. Um, but it but you can see there is a dose dependence. So that's where I went off. The absolute the 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 percent change wouldn't or would be the same theoretically. Yeah. Right, right. Between runs. Between runs, yes, it would be. But I don't think I did that. Well, I, I actually didn't. But I didn't do that because maybe they weren't. And the reason why they wouldn't be is because we're in such a that if I did this run again, I would get the same trend. I did get the same trend, but maybe the trend went to here. But the trend was there, either here or was maybe there, maybe here, but it was there. It wasn't flat. So that was the reason I didn't put error bars on this. Um, but I mean, I was, I was very confident in this. And also that we had an x-ray structure to back it up. That, that was also another confidence. Yeah. Oh, OK. So now let's go into the actual, what do we do with the structure, right? Now that we have kind of what we're looking for, we have a core that we have three compounds that look similar, that bind to, we think, the same place, and we know what protein they bind to. What do we do? This is the easy part, or this is the fun part. I'm not sure if it's easy. But you define the structure with R groups. So it's almost like, all right. are available on the market that we can buy that have the same structure with different R1s and R2s. So I did a ton of searching. That was like, I was one of my COVID projects to, actually, no, this was before COVID. I wish this was during COVID because it would have been a good stay at home thing to do, just like search compounds all day. But I did this before COVID. I did a year before COVID. That um, I would put in the, the size finder and Chem draw and all different structures of things that are substructures and similar structures to find out how many are available that I could just buy with our with our limited budget to uh, assess this structure and really figure out the SAR. That's a key term. I think there's a question on the homework about it. That there's a fifth round of SAR. So SAR is structure activity relationship. So what it means is now that you know the structure that binds. What is the structure of the compound and how does it affect the activity of the compound? So the structure activity relationship. So to assess that, I want different compounds. So it would be really good to even have compounds that you think won't bind that have a similar structure because you can rule out different functional groups. So, for example, I'll just tell you right now this, this R2 group. If you got rid of the entire thing and replaced it with a hydrogen, it wouldn't bind at all. So what that means is, is aha, process of elimination, right? That primary amine is very important for binding. Also, if I got rid of R1 and no value in the hydrogen, what would happen? It would be no binding. That means okay, R2 is important, or R1 is important, and R2 is important. So now, how do we optimize R1 and R2? And then maybe we can add an R3. Something that jumps off on the side. So that's what we do next. That's the real structure based drug design. Is you're designing the drug, you're modifying it however you want. You're designing it from kind of from, well, not from scratch, from this core that we know binds to optimize its, um, its, uh, its function. So 
I did structure-based drug design, and these are the compounds that I ended up buying, a lot of them. And it was, there was more too, but we see that there are some, there's a lot we can figure out. And there's a lot that, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna copy this right here. So we can take a look and compare. Okay, cool. So what we know is that this has a benzyl that's good, but this has a halogen that's good. We go through, I, I studied some key SAR compounds. This one, I'm not sure if you can see it, but they all have the same form, except for these. This one, everything's the same, except I replaced the atom with a uh, piperidine. So you replace the amine with the piperidine, and the activity decreases. So I was seeing 200% activation, and I was seeing a calculable EC50. Now, in that, in that one, I couldn't calculate EC50 because the window was too small, and I was getting a smaller percent activation. That means that's really good that we found that out, because that means that, all right, the flexibility of the primary amine, like this one, that is key. And having a bond. And if you're the, stru the structural biologist and the, the structure based drug design team will look at that and be like, all right, that means I can get that there is a channel in the protein kind of on either side of the primary amine where it, it might wiggle a little bit, but there's residue that are blocking these bonds. So this bulkier structure has a hard time getting in. So it's really using the structure to guide optimization of the, or using the uh, compounds that don't work to guide the optimization of the ones that do. Um, additionally, so let's say it's A15, it's not an amazing I got rid of the benzyl and put all these big, big things. The big thing greatly decreased the activity, but it still had some activity. So what that means is, uh, I, I look at that, all right, this benzyl fits right into a nice hydrophobic bond. This bond wiggles around a lot. And it's like, okay. this carbon, or maybe, maybe the benzyl back in, where the benzyl actually stays in that same pocket, but it's part of the system. So that's why it has decreased affinity. You can kind of go through each SAR, and it's really fun to do that. Kind of like writing down, like, like going through step by step and figuring out what works and what doesn't to optimize your structure. So that's what you do. Um, so at key point two, for the only difference, this one has two bonds. These are going to remain. Everything is the same except for your bromine form. So that one should be pretty easy to figure out. So who can answer that? Why or, or why does that make sense? Or what does that mean? Sorry, what does that mean? That the, putting the bromine on instead of a fluorine makes it a little bit weaker. Yeah, it's not for a good shot. Yeah, but why? Yeah, it's bigger. Yeah, so maybe that so that pocket, even without a, without a structure, without an X-ray structure, you can kind of deduce this information. That the only difference between fluorine and bromine in a biochemical sense is that bromine is bigger. So maybe the pocket that this benzyl ring is fitting into counts for fluorine, but anything larger would be. That's right. That's it. That's all. Definitely, definitely. So polarity is a big uh, influencer in terms of capacity to make hydrogen bonds. Um, so, but here, here's something that I learned that is different than traditional chemistry, is that in the, in the protein concept, context, everything is kind of polar, um, well, except for like nonpolar residues, but a lot of things are polar. So molecule or, or atoms like fluorine, chlorine, and bromine, they don't really behave 
as polarly as they would in a kind of traditional chemistry setting with electronegativity. It's different in biochemistry and drug discovery. And the reason why is because of the electron density is actually displaced a lot more throughout the molecule. And also you have other molecules, you have water molecules all around this. So it's kind of quenching any electronegative, um, electronegative attribute of these halogens, chlorine, fluorine, and bromine. It's not the best ex explanation, but they basically they be they behave differently. So we really so that's a really good thought though. Polarity definitely plays an effect. Um, so yeah, it's a good thought. Uh, fluorine is a lot more polar in a traditional sense than bromine is. So that that could play a big role. But in this case, in in the drug discovery case, fluorine and bromine don't have much of a different electron uh, displacement um, comparing the two. Believe it or not, that's I, I that was news to me when I first learned this in grad school too. Um, so anyway, uh, yeah. Then you have other compounds in the middle of the row. You have AP24, Then you've got fluorines. The fluorines. So does anyone have any comment on that? Uh, but let's just say, why is why am I twenty five be weaker? Yeah, why is twenty five weaker, or why might it be? Right, right. So yes and no. So with the polarity, no, because so like I said, a lot of these halogens they don't behave polarly. Um, it's a weird fact that in structure-based drug design, we look at chlorine very similarly as a methyl group. That's a weird. That's something that you guys should know, or. It's, if you ever go into this, is that in terms of size, they're about the same. And in terms of electron cloud, they're about the same. So we really look at them similarly. Chlorine is like a method. Um, yes. Yes, the other way. Yeah. With, with itself? Yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely plausible. Um, yeah, so I mean, like, but keep in mind, and this is great, like, it's also, even though we're looking at it, it's even what would that be? That might be something, or it might be, um, so that's, that's one aspect. The other aspect is that when we have a really good structure, the fluorines are the fluorine on the um, well, in 24 and in 20, chlorines in the power of the That means the power position. Once the ortho position, then one ortho position could decrease that could be a little bit. So if you have a power of the power, you lose that. So the position might affect the pocket differently. It might fill the pocket differently or not fill the pocket as much as it should. So that positioning of the chlorine matters for those reasons. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, good. So this was developed in the in the enzyme assay. So if I'm saying um, if I had no compound. I take SOS and KROS, I put them in a vial. They go through their enzymatic reaction. And yes, so it, it activates 100%. 220%, that's that's actually not 220% more than 100. That's zero, taking 100, making it zero. 220% more than that. So it's technically three times. Yeah, better, right, right. 
220 times better, or, you know, two times, 2.2 times better, right? So, 63% of that. Oh, good question. Yeah, I didn't I didn't explain that part. Like, what are you looking at? Kind of. Um, but yeah, so um any questions on kind of how you think about that? It's in, so I would say that's one of my main goals for today's lecture is to kind of introduce you to the thought process of taking these structures and assessing their binding capacity and how you could possibly increase it uh, if you make new structures. And you can keep going on to the third problem. But chlorine smaller than chlorine, maybe it just worked well. I don't know. You have structures that don't really work with the with the SAR. They kind of go against the the theme. Or, or go against your hypothesis. This one kind of, but that can be explained by just it works, shut up and it works kind of thing. But there's other ones that I'm not showing 806 because that would have made that would have raised a lot of questions if I presented this to a company. That is a compound 806 like over here that didn't have any binding. 806 is eight oh six. And had no activity. I don't know why. I have no idea why. I'm thinking, well, I, I didn't run mass spec on it. My advice is to run mass spec on it, but I got too lazy. I didn't do it. Maybe they just, maybe the compound was impure and they didn't give us a good batch for that one, possibly. Um, but if, or I don't know, that's, it should have a reduced effect. If I, it should have a reduced effect, but it should have binding, but it didn't. So I don't know what to think of that. But that, so those anomalies will come up. And you can choose whether to ignore them, and most companies ignore them, because if 98% of the other ones work and make sense, then that one might be a bad batch or something else weird with it. Maybe it's um, the solubility of it is less for some reason, and it, it just aggregates and precipitates. Who knows? Yeah, um, another interesting finding. So this was important because what we thought originally is that at physiological pH, this anomaly is protein. So there's going to be a plus charge. So we thought, if we go to the structure, we'll, go, we'll look at here. This is, let's say this is the primary anomaly. We thought that. This will be positively charged and it'll interact with the aspartic acid and it will make an ion interaction. Turns out we have activity even with the hydroxide on the bottom right, wherever, remember mouse, right there. So the fact that we have that hydroxide, um, of the hydroxide as active means that we're not having an ion effect because this hydroxide doesn't get protonated. I, uh, hydroxides don't get protonated. They get deprotonated, if anything. We are seeing then a hydrogen bond. We're seeing a hydrogen bond between that hydrogen and the oxygen of the carbonyl. This one. So we didn't know that up until this point, until testing that compound. So that's why it's important. The point there is, even though some of the compounds are like I didn't really look at, you have to look at every single one at least once. And maybe you'll figure something out that's interesting. So, yeah. even though that one had a different core, that one had a, uh, a benzimidazole core, but it was, that's in a, um, sorry, adenine core. It's similar enough that we would, we can make the assumption that this will bind in the same place that the caffeine will bind. Then here's some FPR stuff. So here, what I did was I tested them on the mutants to make sure they work on the mutants, and they do. SBR stuff. Then here is our uh, comparison to an. So there's one compound that was already developed. 
during my thesis that, that binds to, we think, the same site. And it was actually very similar to my compound, which I was bummed out about. But whatever, it was a whole, it was a whole lab beat me to it at Vanderbilt. I'm just one person, so it's whatever. I graduated, I got out of it. But um, so anyway, benzimidazole core, which is similar to my caffeine. They have the same benzyl ring. They have, they don't have a primary amine. They have a um, diazospiroheptane group, that's what that is. So it's a, it's a, it's basically a primary amine, but it's more rigid. And it's, it's still protonatable at physiological pH there. Same interaction with the aspartic acid. But it also has this group, this piperazine on the core, which was new. And that piperazine made an interaction with the stomach acid on the top. So it actually became a linkage through the through the water molecule here. So that's more plausible. So they had that. We had The, the goal here was like, this is kind of the last stages of my project when I already have a compound that's novel in its mind. And also, let's just clear the air here. Yes, they're similar, but they're far different compared to some drugs you see, right? Like there's, you can take one drug, change the nitrogen to a different drug and get FDA approved. So that happens all the time. So these are pretty different, even though they kind of work we believe they work in the same pocket. They're still, they're pretty different. Um, so anyway, the goal here was to, now that we have an, a working actuary structure to go off of, we have all this data and preliminary work on our own SAR, structure activity relationship. We can now figure out ways to further optimize the core and further optimize the compound class to make them more potent. So what you can do is, this is what I'm like, focus on this that their group had, which I didn't have that. So I was like, all right, maybe we can just add it. Sure. Then I was like, all right, maybe we should get rid of the primary amine, make it a diazospiroheptane, because it's more rigid, it might work better in that whole package that's for the primary amine. So having structures that are more rigid are better and usually more specific compared to this primary amine, which is really flexible and floppy. Um, another aspect that's important is that flexible and floppy is not good for the structure binding, but it's also not good if you're talking about clinical stages. So metabolism, right? Just because we're in this very focused enzyme and chemical space, we still have to think bigger picture. So let's say, so that, that amine, enzymatically cleaved pretty easily. It would be metabolized. So that wouldn't be such a good drug if it got into the body, because, or at least orally, because it might get, it will get metabolized pretty quickly. And we know from the SAR, if this group, so that wouldn't be a good drug. So the diazospiroheptane is more of a rigid structure and has, is stronger to uh, combat metabolism. You have to think of everything when you're thinking about these, these structures, especially in the final stages. I mean, these didn't go into animals or anything, but um, if they were, you'd have to think of all the, the ADME properties. I had synthesis of the two compounds. Um, basically, one of them showed one of them showed really good work, uh, cellular efficacy. Compound two didn't work at all. I think I made it wrong. I don't whatever. Um, compound one was pretty good. It showed a slight activation of PR. This is kind of a bummer because you were thinking, all right, we want a tenfold increase in potency because the enzyme assay, the other group, I think, if you saw where I was at on the bottom, my best compound A26 was at 19 micromole. I was a thousand fold off of affinity. So at this point in my life, I was like, I'm gonna have to be here for another like three years. This is terrible because I'm at that. And the next step was going into the cell. And normally, it's a good thing to know is that 
when you go from the enzyme setting to the cellular setting, you usually decrease your potency by tenfold or maybe more. Because you're, you have to combat with, let's say the media does something, you have to penetrate the cell membrane, which is a big deal. And then you have to be specific to your protein and not 10,000 other proteins in the cell. So it's going to be a lot more challenging to get a compound that already has an enzymatic 19 micromolar affinity into a cell to actually do something than a nine nanomolar affinity one. Because maybe the nine nanomolar in the cell, it might be 100 nanomolar, it might be one micromolar, which is still pretty good. But my, my 19 micromolar, if we're, my advisor was like, if you're lucky, it might be so, it might be if it's still soluble at 500 micromolar, you might see something. And none of these were soluble up to 500 micromolar. So I'm like, I'm screwed. I'm like, what do I do? Right. So what I did when I got lucky is that I put them in the cell. And I put them in the cell, and we are seeing for each 26 around here's 12 micromolar, 25, 50, around 50 to 100, and 200 definitely. We're seeing a pretty good level of phosphoric activity, meaning we're seeing activation. So that was good. That was good. I was very happy about that. Plus, you also, this looks pretty good. You also see like fine like this, like my bubbles and water. you see what's going on is that activating the pathway. So I saw this, I was like, yes, good. I'm graduating, finally, eventually. So I was like, we are seeing cellular activity. And also we were seeing cellular activity after eight hours. We did exposure of these compounds for more than eight hours. For 24 hours, we're actually seeing um, some activity still. That was really good. Now, the uh, the surprise was from the fact that Fessex compound, Fessex the other scientist. If I put this on YouTube, he better not blast me. Um, never respond to my emails either. So he won't blast me. Good for that. Um, but what I was gonna show is look at his best comp, one of his best compounds. Look at what it's doing at around the modular range. It's having its effects. What about my compounds? My compounds are also in the micromolar range, maybe a little bit higher in the 10, 20 micromolar range, but in the micromolar range, they're doing something. Which is like, my advisor was, was surprised. He was like, well, they shouldn't be because the, 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 the compound should be much weaker in the cell than it is in the enzyme. Yours are about the same, the, the mid micromolar range. What's going on? So I was like, wait a minute, okay. What's different between my compound and Fessex compound? The core is different. That's the biggest part that's different. My core is more polar. Um, my core might have a better chance of being permeable to the cell membrane. My core, for some reason, because it has more attachments on it, might be more specific to SOS and KRAS. His core might, half of the molecules might go to a different enzyme. So. Mine might, mine, I have a, that's a good case. I have a good case for mine, or why mine might be more specific and why it might have a higher cell permeability. I took that and I ran with it. So I was like, all right, I gotta make a thesis. This is how I'm gonna do it. So um, it's, it's really good results when you can get micromolar concentrations on the enzymatic and the cellular one. That's really good. Because then from a, uh, from a uh, um, drug discovery perspective, it's much easier to take drugs that have good cellular work and enzyme work to bring them to lower their, or to raise their affinity by making changes, rather than taking a compound that has one nanomolar affinity in the enzyme and one micromolar in the cell. Because you wanna improve the cellular potency, but you really can't because you're, you have one nanomolar in the enzyme, how much can you possibly improve it? So you, you might just come to the conclusion with that compound that, all right, we get it down to as potent as it can be in the enzyme, but in the cell, it just doesn't work that way. 
But with this compound, there is a lot more, a lot of more things you can do to try to optimize both. So we can get nanomolar enzyme and nanomolar cell, which that's further development, which I didn't do. But it was a good start. Now here's the here's the best part. So I saw that, I found that I was like, all right, good, we got cellular activity and permeability, all that stuff. Good. Then I was like, let's put it in the cell proliferation assay. The cell proliferation assay means how much does your cell or how much does your compound inhibit cell growth? The idea is you want to inhibit cell growth if you're stopping cancer. All the compounds, even my even my compound one, which I didn't show on this graph because it really did nothing, did not show uh, proliferation, a decrease in proliferation. That the strongest compound, H26, it did. It showed a proliferation IC50 of 30 or 40 micromolar, which is similar to the cellular Western blot and the enzymatic. That was the best finding. That's why I graduated, because I found that out. And yeah, so that was that was really good. Now the question is, why why do these why does 20, 26 work and A28 doesn't and or 47 doesn't? Or any of the other ones don't? I don't know. I don't know. I really don't know. We knew that A26 is the, the strongest one. So that leads us to believe something. But a big question I keep getting is, how do you know that A26 isn't just killing the cells? Well, you could, I didn't do a cytotoxicity assay. You could. But um, structurally, it's off by an atom of A28. And it, A28 doesn't cause anything, any, any effect. And also visually. So you can look at the phenotype of the cells, because you're looking at them in a microscope. You're counting when you're doing the splits and everything in Western blot, you're looking at them. So you can see if they're detaching from the plate or they're having some kind of weird uh, morphology, right? And you can see if that's that's caused by, or cell-induced, or sorry, um, compound-induced uh, cell death or cytotoxicity, but it wasn't showing any of that. They were really good. So this was the best finding I could see um, from that. Yeah. So my conclusion was that this is probably cellular senescence or it might be apoptosis, but I don't know, but it's, it's good. It's killing the cancer cells. It's really good. And it worked in both cell lines. Now, both of these cell lines have recently been treated. It has a, a KRAS mutation. So it's a, a lung cancer KRAS mutation line. So this shows that, look, we're treating the, the, uh, the clinically relevant cancer line with the drug and it's doing something. That's important. And then HeLa cells have a ton of mutations. So they don't have KRAS mutations, but they have other ones. And it's still doing something. This means that turning off the mount kinase pathway disrupts the other pathways as well in some kind of mechanism that I haven't explored yet. Um, but yeah, so that's basically it. Um, yeah. That's really all I have. Are there any questions about structure or anything? Or about how I, or the, really the, the methodology of structure-based drug design and, and really what you're looking for um, and, and how to approach certain things and from a pharmaceutical perspective and, and getting into, is it worth it? What information do you have? How can you capitalize on it? What compounds do you choose for screening? And, uh, and all those 